to the late spring seminar series for the Solar Card Challenge. I want to share with you the excitement that's building as we approach this summer's Solar Card Challenge at the Texas Motor Speedway. We're making plans to have a safe environment for all of our attendees, as I have published in preceding documents to the team through event updates and letters to teams. But today, it's all about excitement. We're trying to help motivate you and get you excited about what's going on here. I want to share with you the uh, excitement of visiting with a great young engineer from Lockheed Martin. Lockheed is one of our sponsors for the event. His name is Ray Harris. He's an aeronautical engineer working at the Skunk Works in Palmdale, California. So let me introduce you to Ray Harris, uh, a, a friend of the Solar Card Challenge, and I look forward to working with you in the future, Ray. Thank you so much, Dr. Marks. It's, uh, first, I wanna say thank you guys for allowing me to uh, speak um, to you guys. Um, I, I hear a lot about this uh, challenge. It's, it's a, a lot of a cool, amazing stuff, definitely way more cooler things than you know, that I, I've done that when I was younger, and, you know, maybe even cooler than what I'm doing at work, who knows, right? <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but yeah, so um, I'm going to quickly show you as a quick little presentation to give you a little quick background, you know, little, bit, little things on myself. Um, and then after talking about myself, talking about a little bit of, you know, what I do, the company of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works for those who are or aren't familiar with it. And then just overall, just some key takeaways and some key advices and some things that I think can definitely, um, can help everyone, you know, moving forward. Um, I also want to know, also want to also thank everyone, you know, who's involved in the solo challenge this year, um, especially with COVID or last couple of years, uh, it's definitely very hard, but, you know, one of the things that we do as engineers, right, is we always try to find a way to, you know, solve these problems in the toughest of times. So um, this is just another one of those times where we really have to, you know, make use of, you know, the resources and you know, the situations around us, and this is, this is going to either make or break us, and hopefully it definitely makes us. Um, so, uh, good morning again, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, can you guys see, by the way? Looks good. All right, perfect. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Rayon Harris, and I am an aeronautical design engineer for Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, and thank you again for allowing me to speak to everyone. A uh, really quick background about myself. Um, I, per I personally was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York City. Um, so I am a, I am a Yankee boy. Um, however, wasn't, didn't live there too long. I was actually raised in South and Central Florida. Um, Miami, you guys are, are very, you guys, it's a very known city. You guys know all about the you know, city of Miami. Um, but Lakeland, Florida is actually uh, one of, I would say where my adolescence was, where I really kind of grew into myself and really discovered you know, what I really wanted to be. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with Lakeland, Florida, it's in this, a county called Polk County, Florida. Um, it's a really good barbecue over there, and it's a lot of, lot of cool stuff. And I would say uh, it's definitely a lot more popular for, let's say, you know, sports, football, than it is for his academics. But definitely me, it's still a, you know, a nice little hub for people who are interested in doing engineering. Um, I am a first-generation college student. Uh, my parents are both uh, immigrants from, from the Caribbean. My father's from uh, Jamaica, and my mother's from... Um, and a small island called St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And once, and of course you guys can see on the charts, uh, my mom is a real estate agent and my dad, which uh, I kind of highlighted some of the things that he does because it really kind of helped mold my brother and I into, you know, pursuing what we're pursuing right now, which is um, engineers. So my brother actually is also an engineer at Fort Lockheed Martin. He's actually located a little bit closer to you guys. Um, he's at the Fort Worth facility doing some avionics design for you know, all cool stuff, aircraft, you know, if you ever see airplanes flying themselves in the future, it's probably, you know, he's probably one of the leading that effort. So he's doing a lot of cool things out there. Um, I like to say he's doing cooler things than I am, but, you know, it's kind of one of those, it really depends on your opinion, right? Um, yeah, but as you can see from the pictures, I mean, we grew up, you know, pretty close together. Everything my father made my brother do, I kind of just follow his footsteps. And anytime, you know, we're making, put building Legos, I'm always right behind him, like, hey, let me, can I help you? And we always argue, like, no, this is mine. And my dad's like, no, you guys got to share. And that's kind of how we kind of started developing those similar habits and similar interests. Can I jump in and say a word here? Of course. I want to tell you, you've made a lot of people happy this morning already. Because <laughs> yeah. when you said you were born in Brooklyn, our Northeastern teams, I've had texts from both New York and New Jersey 
who are saying, yes, finally, someone from Brooklyn. So this That's is right. great. We That's have a right. team at Brooklyn Tech. So this is great. Oh, I know that. I know Brooklyn Tech. I definitely, uh, when things are up, I need to visit you guys out there. That's awesome. All righty. So uh, quick a uh, quick little uh, educational background. Um, I went to a high school called Lake Gibson Senior High School. Um, graduated in 2014, so I know for those of you who are maybe seniors and juniors in high school, um, I may not look that much older than you, but I, I graduated, you know, a little bit, a couple of years ago. Um, and then after I graduated from um, Lake Gibson High School, I went to a college called University of Central Florida. It is a, it did not become a real popular school in terms of in pop culture until maybe a couple of years ago, you know, with football. I don't know if there's any football fans here, you know, undefeated national champs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I did go to University of Central Florida where I pursued um, a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering. And currently right now I am actually pursuing my Master's in Engineering Management because, you know, uh, one of the cool things when you're working at Lockheed Martin is that you do have the choice to, you know, pursue, continue a technical uh, degree, but a lot of times uh, our managers, they tell us, you just learn so much, you know, on the job training, OJT is that, you know, I feel like you might, ha I have more, there's a lot more, more for me to learn from more of like a business and system engineering point of view and, and, and standpoint, because there's definitely a lot more to learning than just, you know, the real technical stuff. So yeah, that's a little bit about my educational background. And you know, hobbies, you know, I obviously, go ahead. No, that was just my dog making a comment. Okay. All right. If he, if he or she ever has any more comments, feel free to let them ask questions. <laughs> All right. So uh, just a couple quick hobbies. Um, I know a lot of times when, for me, whenever um, I hear a guest speaker speak on whether an engineer or any other background is, they usually talk about what they do, you know, at work, but usually don't hear about, you know, what do they do outside the job too, right? Um, for me, at the end of the day, work is only, you know, 40 to 50, how many hours a week? And you do have a life outside of work. And for me, I, I love doing so many different things. But I can only try to kind of highlight a few of them here. Um, love hanging out with my friends. Friends are kind of cool. Um, I'm, I'm a, actually, a, I like painting. I'm not saying, uh, I don't know if I'm good at it, but I do have fun doing it. So there's that. Um, I love to travel. Obviously, COVID has definitely affected that, but definitely, you know, um, it has been nice to be able to kind of just be creative and, you know, things that you do travel. I know like national parks, for example, have been uh, a much more popular destination for our friends and I to just be able to go somewhere and see something new and, you know, still be able to keep our distance from people. So I think I, that was super nice. For example, I went to Zion National Park actually last year in October with a bunch of friends and that was an experience. If you guys have never been there, please go there. It's, it looks fake. I will, pro I promise you, it looks like some canvas and, it's just so photogenic. Um, some other things I like to do. I love watching playing sports. You guys have heard me mention football a little, a little bit here and there. Um, I'm a huge, I'm a huge sports fan. Um, you know, uh, let's see, let's see what else. I like memes. You know, some of you individuals may like memes. They're they're kind of cool. And for me, I love all things technology. So like the fact that you guys are you know super involved in the solar challenge, it's this is awesome because this is right along the line of things that I'm interested in. I I personally, I drive an electric car. I love, I get all like the little, the little gadgets and, and smart stuff. You know, I, I love flying little drones. They're all super awesome. Tech technology is amazing and, and su super cool to know that, you know, based off of the path that and the trajectory that we kind of are aligning ourselves with right now, we are literally controlling the technology that the world sees in the future. So that's something that I, I always think is super cool. It's like, as an engineer, you're not only someone who can, you know, appreciate technology around you, but you can also kind of like, you know, lead that way. And, you know, if you're telling, my, you're telling yourself, what kind of technology do we expect the world to see in the next 10, 20 years? And chances are you're going to be a part of the team that actually creates that. So I think that is awesome. So um, I talked about a little bit about what got me into engineering. Um, any engineer, if, if you like solving complex problems or maybe simple problems, then perhaps you might be interested in becoming an engineer. Um, of course, creating something tangible from scratch. You know, at the beginning of this challenge, you guys have probably just had pen and paper and you guys are sitting in front drawing, you know, what this car may or may not look like, right? And at the end of it, when you guys are actually at the competition, competition event, you're bringing, you know, a tangible car 
that you're literally driving it. And it's super cool that you're just, that's came out of thin air. And it's super cool because as someone who is, you know, I'm a, I'll see myself as a creator. I love creating art. It is kind of in its own way, a form of art, right? It's like, you, you think about it. I want this to look like this. I can do these capabilities and you put it together and it's something tangible. You can feel it, you can touch it. People can look and be like, wow, you made that. And it's really awesome to be able to do that. And that's all things engineering. And of course, uh, this is the third bullet is actually something as I, I, I definitely um, always think about is finding ways to make creative solutions despite the limited resources. So what are those limited resources? Usually in most situations, those limited resources are is time. Obviously, you know, you gotta get these complex challenges. They have to be completed within this amount of time. Um, money, you know, we don't have a, we don't have a, you know, a bank that has unlimited budget. So you definitely try to see like, okay, where are all the capabilities that we can get that can keep costs under X amount. And of course, another thing now, now right now, because of COVID is like, I would say just overall um, situ like si situations, you know, um, you can't we meet up in huge groups for, you know, different stuff. So you gotta, you know, really try to take advantage of using the virtual environment, virtual meetings and find creative new ways to, you know, solve problems. Um, and then, of course, personally, my favorite one is working with a team of people who are equally as passionate as you. Um, for me, something I can say is uh, I, the, I, I don't know how common this is across other industries, but two of my best friends that I went to college with, we are actually now co-workers, you know, for Lockheed Martin's advanced development programs in Skunk Works. So it was really cool that, you know, we worked together freshman year of college, making these small little RC aircraft together. We're, you know, freaking out like, worried about, you know, our trigonometry test next week and we should be studying, but we're like, no, nah, let's just build this plane. Like, let's have, this is more fun. And now here we are today, you know, working together, building you know, a little bit more comp complex aircraft. Um, so it's, it is really awesome to be able to just hang out with the same group of people. And a lot of people that you work with on your team, you guys have probably have discovered is that you create some really good friendships because it's, it's awesome to, you know, be friends with someone who has a similar interest as you, right? I think that is pretty awesome. When you're growing up, usually you're friends with your neighbor or friends with a classmate and your friends are done based off of, you know, kind of like situation in terms of you guys happen to be in the same class. You guys happen to live in the same neighborhood. But when you meet someone who also has that similar passion and interest as you, which is for you guys, it's uh, the interest in, you know, the solar car challenge is super awesome. You know, how much friendship you can actually uh, gain from that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really awesome working with a team of people who are just as passionate as you for stuff. So um, in this slide right here, I'd like to talk about a little bit of my AWCF involvement. So um, though I personally don't have a mechanical background, my background is in aeronautical. Um, in an earlier slide, slide, I talked about how my father was an um, employee for Florida Power and Light as an electrician, but also working as uh, working for American Airlines. Um, my father being able to work for American Airlines was really, I knew engineering was from just growing up with my brother doing all these little hands-on Legos and building this, you know, water balloon catapults out of wood, stealing wheels and stuff for my dad's tool box and stuff. But really what got me into aerospace engineering was just being around, you know, seeing American Airlines planes flying all the time, you know, this is in Miami, obviously Dallas Fort Worth area is a huge hub. It's the headquarters for American Airlines. So you guys may be familiar with American. Um, but for me, just constantly being around an aircraft really just inspired me just to know, like, wow, like, how is something so big, you know, just flying like that? Like, just seeing that there's literally just young young men and women able to, you know, put their brain power together and just make an aircraft that can fly at those speeds and carry people from, you know, Texas to California within only two and a half to three hours, which years ago, it would take, you know, weeks to do that. So um, that was kind of what got me into aerospace. And then AIAA now. This is kind of like an aerospace organization that's more aerospace focused. It stands for the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And this organization is pretty much all things aerospace. In the college level, they're really focused on, you know, getting those hands-on uh, projects, you know, getting to the design experience. And then in the professional level, it's all about, you know, promoting the growth of the aerospace and defense industry, right? So your companies like your Lockheed Martin, your Boeing, your SpaceX, all these big aerospace companies, you know, it's all about them collaborating together, you know, bringing their like minds, you know, at various conferences or various events, symposiums to make sure that we're constantly advancing the aerospace industry as a whole. 
And so that was, this is a little bit of my ECF involvement. The reason I want to highlight this is because my involvement was what got me to where I am today with my job and my career more than my academics. I never was the smartest person in the class, but it's one thing I could probably try to tell, 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 um, tell myself is that there's not a single individual sitting in this classroom who's more passionate about, you know, aerospace or airplanes than I am, right? You can't teach passion, you know, um, you, you uh, no one can teach that to you. You know, maybe if you do something, only you yourself can become passionate towards something. So it was really awesome. So once I had this passion, that really kind of helped me get me through, you know, college and really kind of get me to point A to point B. You know, as long as I tell myself I want to be an engineer, I didn't care what it took. You know, even if I, you know, weren't, weren't taking those higher level mathematic classes that some of these students were taking their freshman year, I definitely knew that I was going to be an engineer at some point. So that's kind of what got me to where I was. So now uh, a little bit of work experience. So obviously uh, I work for Lockheed Martin's advanced film programs. A lot of the things that we work on is highly classified. So we cannot um, discuss some of the things that we, some of the capabilities or some of the you know, products that we make, but we can't talk about you know, what I do for these products. So before I get to that um, in college, I did intern at Lockheed Martin's missiles and fire control um, as a mechanical design engineer. And as a mechanical design engineer, this is really cool because I was you're 20 years old and that was the first time that you started realizing how young you could really start to have an impact, you know, on the aerospace and defense industry. A lot of you individuals right now who are maybe 17, 18, you know, within just two years, it is very possible for you guys all to be working for these companies like your Lockheed Martin, your SpaceX, your Tesla, you know, and really being able to contribute to it because of the experience that you have right now. I can tell you right now, for example, there are a lot of Tesla engineers that don't have the experience that you guys have, you know, with, with solar energy. And the fact that you are all learning this, you know, at 16, 17, 18 years of age, or maybe younger, maybe older, I think that's awesome. And that's a skill set that cannot be replaced. Um, definitely having experiences, it's not replaceable. It's something that makes you really, really desirable in the industry because people want you. People want you to join their team. They're like, I want you to apply the things that you learn in this program to our company. Like, I want to make the car that can with solar panel that's like a hybrid between solar and electric battery power that can go 500 miles um, and you're going to make that happen so it is it is awesome to really be involved in an organization like you guys are right now that's when i say it's like it's it's not common like i said i did not do that much hands-on um projects when i was in high school i didn't get any of this stuff until i was in college so definitely keep up the great work with that and then of course for now um what i'm currently doing i am an aeronautical design engineer and so by design engineer, um, I am technically, I am by, by all means designing aircraft. Um, so I work with plenty of different teams. For example, we, like, we have a customer like your, like your challenge. You have a customer who says this and this and that requirements. I need an airplane that can do this, do that, do that, do that, and cost this much amount of money. Go have fun with it. And as a design engineer, it's our job to really kind of see what they're, see what the customer is trying to require and try to paint that picture into this craft. So using your 3D modeling, you guys are familiar with SolidWorks. Uh, we don't use SolidWorks here at Skunkworks, but we use the same um, parent company, the Sol Systems, if that, I'm saying that correct, um, is a software called Katia, Katia or 3D Experience. Those are two software suites that we're actually using uh, at ADP to kind of create some of these products that we're, we're making. So definitely having SolidWorks experience, for example, if you guys want to be a designer, for example, when you grow up, that is awesome to have, you know, right now, or maybe even learning 3D Experience or Katia. That's definitely a skill that's very, uh, it's, it's very desirable. So Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, you guys are, if you guys aren't familiar with it, it's, it is, if you may say, it is part of Lockheed Martin's research and development uh, portfolio, right? It is kind of like Lockheed Martin as a whole, they're a business, they make, you know, aircraft that deliver to various different customers, but Skunk Works is like their, their, their baby. Skunk Works is like, hey, Hey guys, we're gonna throw a group of, of, of men and women here and they're gonna be like, all right guys, I need you guys to make me something that's crazy. I don't know what it's supposed to look like. I don't know if we can do it, but can we do it? If we can, you guys are definitely a team to do it. And it's super secretive. I mean, some of the highlights of aircraft that you, that you may have seen in the past, you've seen in pictures or movies, X-Men or whatever. Um, you have, for example, your Blackbird SR-71. Um, this is one of the aircraft that was made for Lockheed's ADP. Um, years ago, maybe 50 plus years ago, um, to the, in the top left, 
but to the right is uh, your X-35. And this was another Scout Works uh, aircraft that was eventually turned into the F-35, which we all know to this day. Um, then we have our F-117 to the right of that, which is a very interesting looking craft. Um, it's not some people, it's, it's some people like to call it the cyber truck of airplanes. Um, it's where it's a very unique design, but obviously, you know, it disappears in the sky or how, how some people will say. And then you have uh, in the top, top right, now you have an aircraft called, uh, I believe it should be the T-80. And this is a very interesting aircraft. And this is actually one of the first, you know, truly skunk works aircraft where um, the customer said, hey, it was during World War II. And they said, hey, you know, this company, they have, they, they have an aircraft, they have jets, jets flying now. We need to make an aircraft that can use jet, jet engines. Um, you guys have, let's say, 200, 200 days to make this aircraft. And Kelly Johnson and his team, they're like, okay, let's see what we can do. We got the, the brightest of minds. They worked real hard. And they were able to put together an aircraft that worked within only 143 days. So um, 143 days, if you guys don't know the math, that's very, very short. Uh, I will tell you right now, most planes, uh, from start to finish, uh, most planes, I would say, is a five-year five year life cycle. Whereas um, some, for example, some, some projects are in you know, maybe 15 months. For Lockheed Martin aircraft, typically from start to finish is about five years. So the fact that they're able to do this in 143 days, I think is insane. I mean, my capstone project in college took longer than this aircraft did. So I think hell is pretty awesome to, to hear about that. And I don't know if we're ever going to get back to doing that um, for, for good reason. Uh, definitely safety is a huge thing for us right now. So a lot of times we do take more of our time when we're designing these and developing these aircraft because safety is of utmost importance and we definitely want to take advantage of the performance of these capabilities. And of course, you know, we have our, you know, we have the U2 right here. She's, she's, a, she's a beauty right there. She's been flying in the skies for, you know, 50 plus years, maybe might be more than 60 years. And it is super awesome to see that an aircraft that was developed, you know, 60 plus years ago, still flying till this day, just because of the capability that it is able to bring. Um, also for, so I know um, Dr. Marks mentioned that I, I do work for Lockheed Martin's ADP in Palmdale, California. Um, for those of you who are in Texas or other parts of the country who aren't familiar with uh, Southern California or in Palmdale, um, though work is in Palmdale, and there's a decent amount of individuals who actually, uh, you know, don't live in Palmdale. For example, I personally live, you know, about 30 minutes south in Santa Clarita, and then uh, after, which is about 30 minutes from work, and then for weekends, I like to call them my playtime, and that is about 30 minutes north of, of LA. Something I definitely want to highlight is, of course, you guys are very, as an engineer, you're going to be working very hard. There's going to be a lot of hours. You're going to create a lot of stuff, but definitely there is that work-life, not necessarily balance, but there's that work-life in integration that you always got to think about, you know. You know, we're always at the end of the day, you got, definitely want to make sure you still have time to hang out with your friends, hang out with your family, and do other things that you just love to do, right? And so for me, something I personally love, I love the beach. I'm a huge, huge fan of the beach. I, I love just seeing mountains and just seeing the sun whenever I get a chance to. So it's definitely nice that a lot of these companies, for example, are in really good areas to where you could do really cool stuff, you know, on the weekends and have that kind of like outside of work life. And additional locations, um, Marietta, Georgia, it's about 25 minutes north of Atlanta. And uh, Fort Worth, Texas, which you guys are probably familiar, is about, you know, let's say 20 to 30 minutes uh, uh, west of uh, DFW. Um, and then just for these Skunk Works locations, Skunk Works is only a division of Lockheed Martin Aeronautics. And so that's why it's only really located at three primary sites. Now, of course, I did mention that a lot of the, the um, capabilities and a lot of the aircrafts that we make, we can't talk about. However, this is one of the cool ones that we can talk about. Um, this is the X-59. It is uh, one of the projects that I worked on for, for a bit. And the purpose of this uh, aircraft is, if you re read on the screen, it's, it's all about silence and the sonic boom. A couple of years ago, NASA was doing some research and figuring out, hey, we haven't flown supersonic in a commercial jet in years. Like, why, why are we First thing they're figuring out is why I can't why haven't we been flying supersonic jets? And then once they figure it out, obviously a lot of times it's the noise pollution or maybe it's the fuel economy. They're trying to figure out do we have the capabilities to make something like this? And so what NASA would do is that they would do all the research and then once they do all the research now, they set some requirements and they, you know, knocked on Skunk Works' door and be like, Hey guys, I have a challenge for you. Can you guys make us an aircraft that 
can fly super fast, but it's designed in a way where it mitigates the the sonic boom to to the fact to the point that it can actually fly over communities because. Um, if you guys aren't familiar, most aircraft that are flying supersonic, for example, the Concorde years ago, was not allowed to fly supersonic over land. You know, you'll take off, it'll fly subsonic, nice and slow like a regular aircraft, and once it's over water, then it'll be able to fly to Europe, for example. But that was a huge issue because a lot of its money, for example, a very popular route, you know, your Texas to New York, Texas to LA, LA to New York, LA to Florida. Those are very popular routes that involve you flying over land. So a lot of its market that it was looking for, it just wasn't there just because of, you know, the the um, environmental factors of, you know, no one wants to wake up at two o'clock in the morning because you hear a big thud, right? So uh, this X-39, this is a, what it is, it is, it is actually an experimental aircraft that is going to be designed. It's going to be think, uh, one, one man aircraft to test out, you know, the loudness of a sonic boom. And it is going to have its first flight either probably probably um, either between mid to late next year. And after it has its first flight, you're actually going to do some tests and fly over random communities. So it might fly over your neighborhood and you have no idea. And if you have no idea, then maybe it's a good thing, right? Because that means that it's not that not that loud. So um, it is a really cool project to to work on. The the um, engineering behind it is is awesome. Uh, one of the challenges, obviously, that occurred with this obviously with um covid is that you have to work try to figure out you know how how can we continue to make an aircraft like this and assemble it manufacturing it while being in a virtual environment a lot of engineers now are actually you know designing this aircraft you know from their bedroom you know right next to their xbox and the only people who are really at work are the guys who are actually putting together the aircraft the manufacturing engineers but it was a very interesting experience on being able to still you know make a X, an X aircraft while still being able to, you know, work from home. So I'm sure that a lot of your team, your teammates are kind of going through the same um, process right now. I know you'll love to be, you know, sitting down in a library or somewhere, gather with your, your team members and sit down and really kind of tackle these challenges together. But um, very similar to you guys, we're also here at hockey, you know, trying to find creative ways, you know, lots of Zoom calls. We have these things like, why, why do these wings look like this? Well, it's too small. It's too heavy. We got to figure something out. So it's, it's a, definitely a very interesting challenge to deal with. And this is just a little bit of more of a background talking about what is the purpose of it. And hopefully if the data looks good, then um, commercial supersonic uh, travel will definitely become more of a thing in the future. Hopefully uh, not only we can fly supersonic, but also design in the ways to where they're a lot more fuel efficient. Because definitely one of the things we're trying to go towards is uh, you know, having more energy efficient aircrafts all around. Now, uh, that was a little bit about what um, I'm working on with Lockheed Martin and what Lockheed Skunk Works is working on, at least from the unclassified environment. But something I really want to highlight and talk about, I, I think some, have some good takeaways for you guys, are just the various challenges and obstacles that I had to deal with. Usually when I have guest speaker come and talk, they always talk about some of the great things that they're doing. And, and you know that they're there, they're where you want to be or they're they seem to be like, you know, in a good spot, but you don't hear about the challenges. They don't talk about it, but the challenge is still there. They do exist. For example, this is a quick little overview of challenges and obstacles that I had to deal with in college. Um, for a lot of you who are maybe in college or maybe going to college or university soon, um, this is kind of like a quick little highlight of some of the challenges I had to deal with. So for example, my freshman year, uh, my high school was not a wasn't too technically savvy, you know, a lot of kids, you know, rather become farmers after they graduated or just not go to school. So I did not really, I, when I went to UCF, I went to UCF literally by myself. I had my brother who was already there in attendance, but um, at the, I mean, but when you're two years apart, you kind of want to make your own friends. So that was, a, uh, that was a challenge. And of course, it's adjusting to a college environment, just like kind of like we're, how we're going from in person to Zoom. It's all about an adjustment, right? So for me, it was a huge adjustment for freshman year. Sophomore year, uh, definitely wanted to get out and do more activities, but, you know, didn't have a car. So I was very limited on how I can get around. Um, obviously, lack of funds. I was a, you know, what is known as a broke college student. I couldn't afford anything. I want to do a lot of things. So I couldn't do much. And I actually, this is actually when I started just getting more involved and just making more RC aircraft you know, on the side because I couldn't really leave campus. So I'll just go to an engineering lab and found some wood on the side and just teach myself like, all right, 
let's let's make some aircraft. I wasn't in the higher technical classes um, that that I was exposed to until my junior senior year, but I was trying to just learn what I can to be like, okay, what is the bare minimum that I need to know to make an aircraft? And then of course, uh, junior year now, uh, engineering classes, they're definitely not easy, but uh, thank you, Chegg. If you guys use Chegg right now, he'll definitely be using it in the future. Um, shout out to them. Um, those 20 bucks a month, I, I promise you, they, they, they definitely help. And more importantly, they obviously help you get through the homework, but it's a really good way of really teaching you because a lot of college professors, like, don't be surprised if they're super full of themselves and they think they're smart than everybody and they assume that you know everything, right? That is not the case. Like a college professor is gonna make it very, very easy for you to feel like you're you're not intelligent, you don't you should know more. But definitely that's not that's not the case. You're not alone. Trust me, that was me in all my classes. And uh, so Chag definitely was a really good resource to really kind of um not say necessarily dumb it down for me, but explain it in a way where it's like a there's a book called something something for dummies. If you can't teach it to a five year old, then maybe you're not teaching it well, right? So Chag did a really good job of making that easier. And of course senior year, at the end of the day, I mean um being in college, you definitely want to enjoy the, the full round college experience of, you know, working, you know, school, but obviously, you know, you still want to go out, you know, maybe party if, if you're interested in doing that. And it's overall your life balance, you know, checking on your, checking on your physical health, you know, make sure your, your physical health, your mental health, that's super important. Um, and just overall, all these things that you really want to take care of yourself and just kind of balancing all of that. And then for me in particular, my, my experience is uh, running an organization. Uh, because of my passion in making aircraft, you know, my freshman and sophomore year, a lot of the seniors realized that, okay, this kid may have the potential to keep this organization going. We don't need somebody who's the best at making airplanes to run an organization, but someone who's passionate about the direction that the organization would be going in the future. And because of that, I was lucky to find myself in a situation where I ended up becoming the president of, of, of the organization and continuing to seeing it grow. And then... Um, Back to finally um, senior year part two um, for me. College was a five year, uh, five year, five year uh, experience, unlike most other majors. Um, refer to image. Uh, this is fine. It's kind of like uh, everything that all the challenges just kind of see all thrown together in a, in your last year. You're trying to get everything together, but now you're done. You're, you're thinking about jobs and all these things we're going to do after college. But the one thing I can definitely say is that. Um, if you are passionate about what you're doing and really enjoy what you're doing, I promise you, you don't have to look, go out there looking for jobs. The jobs will come and look for you and find you. And which kind of translate into this, uh, one of my other slides for uh, overall career advice. Um, they say you only go as far as your network. Um, some people like to always say, they say what, your network is your net worth. Uh, but more, even if you don't even care about that, when I talk about your network in terms of the, the people that you're working with on your teams right now, uh, the individuals that you really get along with, you'll be, without even you, you'll be surprised at you know how many years you guys are going to be working together in the future. Even if you guys are working in different industries for different companies, the fact that you guys met each other, you know, did this challenge, you guys are always going to have that experience to be able to share for the rest of your life. You're going to be laughing 20, 30 years from now, be like, man, remember when we did that challenge? And look at us now, you know, making solar panel car that goes a thousand miles or using, you know, nuclear fusion or something. Um, so definitely uh, take advantage of the, the friendships and the people that you're meeting right now. Those are definitely people that you want to, you know, hang on to. Um, also, next thing, um, your passion will carry you farther than your intelligence. Uh, people can read passion like nothing. They, if you're at a company and they see that you're passionate about something, but they see that you're not the best at what you're doing, they don't care. They're going to be, they're going to put you, give you, give you those challenges. They're going to hire you over the guy who's smarter because, the guy who's passionate isn't going to give up when it, when it going gets tough. There are people who are super intelligent who can solve these problems, but if it gets too hard, they're like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. And they just walk away. But someone who's passionate is like, no, I'm not going to give up until the product gets done. And that's what we need in the industry. That is what in, we need as engineers, people who are passionate about what they're doing, people who aren't going to give up until it's done, right? Um, and then, of course, next thing is uh, when you're in a struggle, don't be afraid to reach out to help. I don't have this on these slides, but I'll definitely be able to um, have my information uh, sent to you guys on, on if you guys ever need any assistance or want to reach out to me for any assistance, I'll be more than welcome to, you know, just have a chat with you guys, even if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it could be after work hours, during work hours. I personally don't mind. I, this is stuff that I love doing. I love definitely talking 
to you guys and and so maybe you guys can learn some things from me and maybe some and maybe i can learn some things from you guys so um another thing too is your classmates and your teammates uh they are your teammates and not your enemies there are going to be um, situations where you guys may not get along together with some of the things that you're doing but at the end of the day if you just sit back and understand that you your disagreements you guys are having is because of you know all it's all for the same cause right you guys all want to build a successful car you always want to build a successful aircraft you want to build a successful this or a successful that so just remember that um don't try to make enemies out of people in your group you guys are together just as a team you know you guys are going to only work better as a team i was actually speaking to my manager earlier this week on uh, a lot of challenges that these companies have and who are, aren't meeting deadlines is because of team dynamic more than technical you know more than the technical knowledge because when you have a team dynamic you don't feel comfortable working with somebody so you don't want to go out of your way to get a problem or the challenge done and that's where things get behind so definitely uh, uh there's no i in team you guys heard that many times and then the last thing i have is just i usually i would put in this slide i would say get involved but for you guys that's definitely not a problem so i would just say uh continue to stay involved continue to stay involved with what you're doing um you guys are obviously doing a really good job of that you guys got the ball rolling early um for some of you who are going to be involved in high school and go to go off to college university and aren't continuing to pursue the solar challenge but continue to stay involved in, in the organization because i definitely think uh when you're in an organization it's really good to kind of put yourself in a situation where you feel comfortable you feel like you can really grow into yourself as an individual and by attending these national conferences and events you will constantly find yourself meeting more and more people like you and you realize that there are more people like you than you think there are and the irony is that these national events and the people that you're going to meet um your network are going to be the people that are actually going to help you not only get your first jobs but kind of help you just advance in your career right i want to thank you for saying that because yes. it gives you a chance to echo something that i've been saying when you finish the solar car challenge come back be a part of the staff be a judge i really appreciate that by the way, I want to say you've been absolutely one of the best speakers we've had. I, I really appreciate what you did and the way that you shared your background, but also then went on and showed how you use that to get where you are. So I appreciate you, and I'm, uh, I just look forward to working with you in the future. I hope you'll stay on and see what one of our captains of a solar car team, Eric Andertrek, has to say about the use of artificial intelligence. Ooh. Uh, Lehman, bef before we switch to that really quick, um, Ray, we did have a question for you. Um, it was asked, uh, is Creo not a program used in aeronautical engineering? Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? So good, very good question. It is actually a program used. Um, so if Creo were talking about PTC Creo, um, it is used, but it depends on the program. For example, Lockheed itself has four unique divisions. They have Excuse me, you have space division, you have aeronautics, you have missile and fire control, and then you have um, rotary mission systems. Uh, Creo is more so, I would say, used in space and missiles and fire control, but CATIA is more used in the aeronautics division, but that is also only for Lockheed Martin. Other companies, they some other companies use Creo as their primary you know, design suite. For example, if I'm not mistaken, Northrop Grumman uses a lot of Creo on their aircraft, the B-2 bomber, some of the other aircraft that they're making, Creo is also a really good skill to have. But definitely, I mean, if if you know Creo, that is, I mean, catting is catting. Or if anything, it may only take a week to two weeks to really kind of get up to speed to really know Katia. Because, for example, Katia isn't really offered that much in high schools or college. You might be able to go and download a free trial, but for a lot of us engineers, we walked into it knowing SolidWorks, and that was it. Maybe, maybe MX and maybe AutoCAD. Maybe we touched it, you know, a little bit for like a little freshman project, but um, it doesn't matter what software that you're using, as long as you're using a CAD software and you have experience in that, it'll definitely translate well into other softwares. Very good question. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Eric Andrzejczyk, captain of the Okemo Solo Car team. Eric surprised me with his interest in artificial intelligence and how you might be able to use that within a solo car project. And I have challenged him to be our guide in the future as we're wanting to move forward to bringing this kind of technology into the event. No, I don't see us having 
artificially driven solar cars going around the track, but the use of it in uh, some other applications are remarkable. So Eric, thank you for joining us this morning. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Marks. Um, so I am Eric Andercheck. I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence in solar cars. So to start, uh, who am I? I'm Eric, I'm a senior at Okemos High School in Okemos, Michigan. Uh, I am starting software engineering at the University of Michigan this fall. I'm the current captain of the Okemos Solar Racing Club, uh, the winner of the 2019 Governor's High School Cybersecurity Challenge, and uh, half a dozen or so hackathons. So in my free time, I really like to code, and you can always find me procrastinating homework by working on some other engineering project in my free time. Um, I have any I have engineering projects going at any given time, at least two or three. Um, so to start, we're going to kind of go over a basic overview of what artificial intelligence is. And to put it simply, it is teaching a computer to do something that it would be hard to algorithmically define. So in the case of a solar car, um, if you have telemetry on the car and you are trying to determine the speed of the car, you can take a sensor on the wheel and know how many rotations it makes and plug it into a formula to do some quick math and figure out how fast the car is going. That's relatively straightforward to program. But if you were to try to teach your car or get your car to predict what your speed is going to be tomorrow based on cloud cover and how your batteries are doing, or even if there's an obstacle in the way, that's something that is much harder to explicitly program and tell the car to do. So that's something where we would introduce artificial intelligence. And we would, rather than try to program the car and explain how to identify a human, we would just give it lots of pictures of people and let it learn on its own how to identify what a human looks like. Um, so typically when people think about artificial intelligence in cars, they think about Tesla. That's at the forefront of self-driving technology. And so on the right there, you can see uh, some dash cam footage from a Tesla and all of the things that it's looking at and identifying. And so that is actually commonly referred to as computer vision. So computer vision and AI are slightly different. Um, computer vision is looking at pictures and video and images and using kind of a combination of AI and algorithms to identify things. So for the purposes of what I'm gonna be going over, I'm primarily gonna talk about computer vision. Um, that's easier to kind of demonstrate and something that's easier to run on the technology that most high schoolers have access to. Um, so how does computer vision, AI, self-driving apply to solar cars? Um, so in terms of self-driving technology, it's commonly referred to as having six different levels of self-driving, uh, six different levels of automation. So level zero is no automation. That would be all of the solar cars on the track right now. That's the human does everything. They might have some data and telemetry, but they are fully controlling the car. Uh, level one of self-driving, you have driver assist. So if you have a car that has some like lane detection stuff, so when you start to leave the lane, it beeps at you to tell you that you've left it, that would be kind of a level one uh, self-driving car. Then level two, that's the current stage of Tesla autopilot. So uh, in commercial vehicles on the road, current law says that they can't exceed level two without lots of clearance. So for most applications, Tesla is level two. You know, some things it can go into level three, some are closer to level one, but it tends to stick around a level two of self-driving, which means that it can control acceleration, steering. It can do many, many things, but there is enough error and enough issues that it won't know how to deal with that the driver needs to be engaged at all times. Uh, level three then, this would be something like if you've ever been in a car that has some sort of traffic jam chauffeur, that would be an example of a level three self-driving car. So if you're in 
traffic on the freeway and it's just packed. Um, you can turn this on and it would just keep you driving forward between the cars. And so that would be something where obviously you still should be paying attention, but you can be much less engaged than in a level two self-driving. Um, then on to level four. So the picture in the bottom right there, that is me and my dad at the University of Michigan. They have this amazing test facility called M-City. And it is this massive, um, basically fake city that they've built up with lots of obstacles and things that will get in the way for them to test their self-driving cars at. So I had the opportunity about two years ago to go and tour M-City. And so I actually got to ride in one of their uh, self-driving cars, which you can see behind me there. And that would be considered a level four self-driving car. That's something that can do just about everything on its own. And you could easily put that in the real world and have it be able to do just about any task you give it without much issue. Um, it isn't perfect. So there are still requirements to have driver intervention. So it was actually kind of interesting when we were in the car, they don't have a steering wheel in that little bus thing. So there's an M city employee that sits in there with an Xbox controller. And that's how they intervene with the car. If it is to do something wrong. Um, so that's pretty cool, but obviously that's not perfect. Uh, so level five of self-driving cars, that would be full automation. That's what everyone's working towards. That would be, if you were to push the button on your phone to call an Uber and it drives and picks you up and takes you to your destination without anyone in the front seat, that's a level five self-driving car. That's what everyone's working towards. So why is this beneficial? There are two main reasons to how this is helpful, especially in the solar car application. Uh, this is greatly increasing your efficiency. You, for a solar car, in our race could potentially have no driver in it, which is already cutting lots of weight. And then if you think about removing a, uh, the seating area, the steering apparatus, the crumple zones that protect the driver, all of those things, you could make your car much smaller, a much more sleek um, aerodynamic profile that would just greatly increase the efficiency. Um, in addition to that, you have like cruise control and knowing where to drive on the track. So for any teams that have been to the Texas Motor Speedway, I know it's a great point of contention that everyone's arguing about whether it's best to stay on the inside of the turns or if you go kind of up and get close to the banks on the turns and then ride the hill down coming out of them. I know that people disagree about which one's better in the competition. So using AI and uh, advanced telemetry systems would be something that you could definitively know the answer to. And this could control precisely where the optimal path is, keep you in between the lines on the road and right where you want it. Uh, and then in addition to that, you have driver safety. So most current cars with self-driving features, they are marketed as being safety features. So if you have, you know, lane detections, so when you're leaving your lane, that's for safety. You have automated braking. So if there's a car in front of you that's slowed down and you can't react fast enough, it can and it'll brake. That's something that even if you had a driver in your solar car, that's something that could still be beneficial to the safety of everyone involved. Um, and it's, it's like two eyes on the road, right? You have the car and you both monitoring. And then... Lastly, with that, if you have a crazy telemetry system on your car, it's really hard for you to monitor and be able to keep an eye on every single data point. You might have too many temperature sensors or too many different data points coming in from your car to know what all of them mean and how they are relating to the health of the car. So if you have a computer system or an artificial intelligence monitoring all those sensors to keep your car running at optimal performance, it would be much easier for the car to identify before you would even recognize that maybe this specific battery cell is warming up higher than we'd like it to. And it could take mitigation efforts to prevent that. 
that's something that would be beneficial with a more integrated system. Um, so when we were talking about on this slide here, the different types of automation, if you were to look at that M-City car, um, that takes a very different approach from a Tesla. So Waymo, Google's self-driving cars, um, these M-City buses that they've built there and lots of other companies take the approach of GPS and LiDAR and radar. So they will follow a very specific GPS track down the road and they use radar and LiDAR to detect obstacles in their path. Now, that is much more easy to set up from an engineering perspective, but the problem is that it can't identify what the obstacle in its path is or how to get around it. So one of the examples that we were given at M City was on their testing track at one point, there was like a heavy storm the night before and a small branch fell in the road. And the M City bus approached the branch, recognized there was an obstacle there, but it didn't know what it was or what it should do. And so it stopped and called for help and waited for people to come and remove the branch. Now, if you were to put something in front of a Tesla, you can see that it can drive around it. It knows how to avoid the obstacle, or if it's just something relatively flat on the ground that it can just drive over. So in my opinion, at least, I believe that Tesla's approach is much more robust and will be more successful. So I will be um, kind of going over Tesla's approach more than anything. So to start with getting your car to be able to drive itself. Um, arguably the most important thing is getting it to be able to stay within the lines on the road. So this is all code that I have written and tested all myself. Um, I found a, some dash cam footage on the internet and pulled that down. And so this is kind of my process for finally successfully getting it to identify um, lines in the road. So we have that original image up there. Um, this is the one that I had. Um, and before we start processing it and trying to figure out where things are, it was a pretty high resolution image, which is what you want when you're trying to feed it to an artificial intelligence. But if we're gonna use strictly computer vision to identify lines on the road, we want it to be as fast as possible. We don't want this to be a five second latency from when it's seeing the road. So the first thing we do is we remove all the color from the image, which reduces its size and makes it easier to handle. And then we kind of blur the pixels a little bit. It doesn't need to be as crisp as it was. And so that's what you get in this middle of the top row. Um, it's a blurred and black and white version. Then we start of kind of start to go into that algorithms and the math and we manage to get all of the lines out of it. So how that works is it's basically finding the differences in contrast between pixels, uh, finding the derivatives of their slope to calculate kind of angles and things. And that ends up producing what you see in the top right, those lines, uh, which looks really cool, but that's not very helpful. We need specifically the lines on the road. So from there, my next attempt was to try to find straight lines. If we could, so if you see like the mountains and the tree lines there, those are all really jagged and bumpy. So if we can successfully tell the computer that we only want it to find straight lines and it maybe will be able to ignore those and just see the road lines. So that's the code I wrote. And then you got this second row, the middle box there, that's what it turned into, which I don't really think I'd want to be in a car that's driving between those lines. So here it is on the right there, um, overlaid on top of the original video. You can see that that didn't really work. So I went back to the drawing board to try to figure out how I could fix this issue. And something I kind of noticed was if you look in the top right image there, um, Assuming your camera is at a fixed position on your car and assuming that the lanes on the road don't change width, which I would say is safe to assume, 
uh, the edges of the lanes remain in relatively the same position in the car's camera vision. And they converge to a center point in the middle there. So if we can tell it to just pay attention to that specific area, we can A, make the process a lot faster because it doesn't have to even think about all the other things. And B, hopefully be more successful with identifying just those lines. So that's what I did in the bottom left there. Um, it's just a triangle now that it's finding straight lines out of. And then you can see the blue lines in the bottom middle, they're a lot more successful. And overlaid on your final image, you have something that actually looks correct. And so you can take this and feed it pretty much any video of a road, and it will be able to produce this result just about every time, which is really cool. Um, but that's just a part of it because in this processing, we have removed all of the data except for the road. So if someone in your original footage were to step out in front of your vehicle, the computer vision is not looking at that at all. It has no way of knowing. And that is very important. Um, so the next piece of it is identifying people. And this moves out of computer vision and more into artificial intelligence. So this is, this is using a program called Darknet. Um, and it is a type of object recognition program. So if you've ever used something like Google Photos, where you upload your pictures and then you can search for objects in your pictures, this is doing something similar to that. They've got a lot of different objects that have been trained for this model. So it knows what a car and a truck and a person and a dog and a cat and lots of other things will look like. And it is able to then take a piece of footage or a picture and identify what different objects are, draw bounding boxes around them, find their coordinates and give you a estimated level of confidence. So this works very well. In the bottom left there, you can see some dash cam footage with a person running out in front of the car. And it is 100% confident that that is a person. So if you had a secondary camera or you knew the focal length of the camera that took this image, you could figure out the distance to that person. You could triangulate where they are and you could know if they're in your way or if they were stationary. And if that person was stationary, you can tell the car to just go to the left until they're no longer in frame and then drive around them and then go back into the middle of those lane lines. Um, so this is something that is gonna be very important for safety and for identifying different obstacles that might be on the road. You can see even it's identifying things like traffic lights. And so with some more work, you might be able to get it to figure out the color of the traffic lights. Uh, which is pretty much what Tesla is doing right now. So the problem though, is that in say a solar car application, as Dr. Marks was talking about, um, it is hard to get a computer that matches Tesla's performance. So that video in the top right there, just a 10 second clip of cars driving down the highway and one crashing. It took 30 minutes for this program to go frame by frame and identify all the objects, draw their boxes, and then move to the next frame. So the 10 second clip at 30 frames per second took 30 minutes, which is obviously not ideal. A Tesla can maintain 20 frames per second and do that steadily the entire time. So that's something that we really need to work on. Um, and so how does Tesla do it? So in your solar car, if you were to use the most advanced Raspberry Pi there is, you've got a Raspberry Pi Model 4B that has 13.5 gigaflops of processing power. Specifically, that's related to the GPU in the computer, um, which is basically the part of your computer that's best at performing artificial intelligence and computer vision processes. So Raspberry Pi has 13.5 gigaflops. And that can run it in about 30 minutes for 300 frames. The newest Tesla, the Model S, with their HW3 computer system, they have 10 teraflops of processing power. 
So just shy of a thousand times the Raspberry Pi's AI power. Um, so that's basically why it's able to do it when we can't match that pace. So I don't know how you would solve that problem. That would be something that you can do more work on and that we need to figure out for this to become feasible. For the time being though, you can take the approach that companies like Waymo and M-City have, and we can use these ultrasonic sensors. And mounting a couple of those on different parts of a car would be able to tell you the distance between objects. It can't identify what the objects are this way, but it could at least identify where they are and if something has come in front of the car. And this can be done in basically real time, which would be a great way of kind of intercepting that data and making it more feasible to exist in a car in the near future. Um, so that about wraps up everything I had to talk about for artificial intelligence. Uh, it was kind of just a brief overview. So I have included uh, my GitHub here. You can go look at all of the code that I wrote and test it for yourself on whatever you want. Um, the PowerPoint is also on my GitHub. And so you can click on the additional readings. I have some more interesting articles if this is something that is interesting to you. And if you have any questions or anything, uh, let me know. Eric, thank you. That was an exciting presentation. I look forward to seeing what happens as you develop this for solar cars in the future. Now you're a senior, but you're gonna be coming on to work with us as staff. And one of your focuses in the years ahead is to see how we can implement AI. It's the way of the future. So let's see what, I, I challenge you to see what you can come up with. Thank you for giving us a great presentation. Our next presenter is Alan Phipps with the Florida Atlantic University High School. And he's going to be talking to us about the uh, new exciting cruiser division solar car that they're working on. Alan? Good morning, everybody. Um, it, it is our distinct pleasure to share with you today a little bit about our progress on our solar cruiser project. Um, we're at Florida Atlantic University High School, solar, um, auto, solar Owls Autonomous uh, Automotive Racing Team. Sorry, we just did a, a presentation on autonomous and that was really interesting. So uh, but we're the uh, automotive racing team. Our uh, high school is uh, unique in that it's uh, a dual enrollment program located on the Boca Raton campus of Florida Atlantic University. So our students in ninth grade, they uh, are part of our K-8 campus that's on the FAU uh, Boca Raton campus. Uh, tenth through twelfth grade, our high school students are fully dual enrolled at the university and are able to take um, all kinds of courses there at the university. So a uh, little bit about what we'll do in the next 15 minutes. So after a brief introduction, uh, we'd like to share with you a little bit about our approach to aerodynamic design, uh, scale modeling, uh, human modeling to make sure our, our, our people are going to fit in our car. Um, a little of the, the challenges we've had with some 3D printing of prototypes, and then um, some about our innovative foam mold process and then composite testing. So I've got a little bit of experience with solar car challenge. Um, I used to work at South Plantation High School uh, where I started the Solar Knights racing team um, and we raced for uh, six years, um, four track races and, and two cross country races. I was, I was really so impressed with the students here at FAU High School that we decided to jump back into solar car racing um, and they started on this new cruiser division um, when it was announced in the 2019, 2020 season. Uh, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we've not been on campus for over a year. In fact, our, our high school students, because they're taking classes with college students and, and, and mixing with them, our administration has decided that they're, they've eliminated all extracurricular activities to reduce contact between the high school students and our, our K through eighth grade students. So we are actually currently in a, in a warehouse uh, with some temporary space. Uh, we've found some innovative, unique ways to continue working on the project. Um, albeit at a, at a slower pace than, than we'd prefer. Um, pictured here are our team leaders. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Maria, our president, uh, Tihan, our vice president, uh, Crystal, our secretary. Um, they're gonna help with today's presentation. 
Um, and then Ayush is our treasurer who uh, could not be here today. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to our vice president, Tihan, to talk about aerodynamic design and our research in that area. So there we go. So hello. In the fall of 2019, I wrote and won an undergraduate research grant to study the aerodynamics of several solar car designs. As part of this research project, I 3D printed four different models seen here. I was specifically looking at the effects of having a setback windshield like a sedan or forward uh, windshield like a minivan. For each of these, I also tested with and without a central tunnel. I then took these 3D printed models over to FAU's Ocean and Mechanical Engineering Department and conducted wind tunnel experiments with them. I also did CFD testing to complement the physical testing, as well as to qualitatively visualize the airflow around the car. Now I'll turn it over to Maria, our resident, to speak about physical modeling. Hello, my name is Maria. Um, so we used our laser cutter and Dollar Tree foam board to mock up a simple model of our solar car chassis we then used wooden mannequins to ensure that all four people would fit in the car. We eventually moved to creating a full-scale mock-up of the chassis, as you can see on the right. Spending around $200 for some plywood and PVC allowed our team to really visualize the size and scale of the car, while also allowing us to mock up our front and roof suspension in 3D printed parts to ensure we had all necessary clearances. As the team began catting our car, we wanted to make sure that our team members would each fit with the necessary clearances for the roll bar, roll cage, and crush zones. We used a free program called Make Human to create avatars of our team members. Our largest team member is six foot six, while our shortest team member is five foot two. Creating our own avatars ensured all team members would fit in the car regardless of their body size. After creating the avatar in Make Human, we imported it into Blender along with a CAD model of one of our seats. Blender allows you to articulate these avatars into a seated position. We then we were able to import the seated team member into the program of our choice. One of our team members isn't well versed in CAD, but knows how to use SketchUp. So they place the avatars into a SketchUp model for visualization purposes. It has been extremely challenging to work on the Solar Cruiser during COVID. During the summer, our suspension team would work on CAD models, send them to Mr. Phipps so that he could 3D print the prototypes assemble them in his garage, and then send marked up screenshots with suggestions and modifications. The iterative design process took a very long time when trying to arrange from our various homes. Um, but now I will hand it over to Tihan. So here are some screenshots of our solar car body and chassis. As a note, the roll bar isn't included in these specific shots. And one other thing you might um, notice there is the absence of a tubular roll cage. Instead, we plan to use a unique carbon fiber composite board to serve as the roll cage. Additionally, the external carbon fiber composite board will have a much thinner foam core so as to serve as the crushed zone material. Crystal, who will be speaking next, wrote and won an undergraduate research grant to study these carbon fiber composites. She's working with Dr. Carlson at FAU, who does research on sandwich composites. To you, Crystal. <laughs> Hello everyone. My name is Crystal and I'm the secretary of the solar car team. So our team reached out to Dr. Leif Carlson who runs the composite lab here at Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Carlson wrote a book entitled Structure and Failure Mechanics of Sandwich Composites. Dr. Carlson and Mustafa, Dr. Carlson's graduate student has provided valuable information on testing composites and analyzing the data we collect. We're collaborating with their lab to test samples we purchased from Rockwest Composites. We'll use the composite testing data collected to compare to the ones we plan on making under the direction of Jordan Haar from Vectorply. Our composite team used Vectorply's online tool called VectorLam to create 15 different laminate combinations. We then met with Jordan Haar to discuss and analyze which of these laminates we should make and test. Our composite layup will use various core materials and specific locations to help strengthen the carbon fiber chassis. As Tihan mentioned, the body will use a much thinner foam core that'll hold its shape, but still yield a and, and provide an adequate crush protection per the competition rules. Now back to you, Tihan.
Once we finalized the chassis shape, we created a negative mold as seen in the picture below. Vectorworks gave us a great deal on milling our molds if we were able to rough cut the foam to within two inches of the final milling. This wrapped our milling cost from $12,000 down to $5,000. We also partnered with our local Home Depot who sold us four pallets of two inch thick XPS insulation foam for more than 50% off. I adjusted the size of this CAD to allow for two inches of milling and added a four inch lip of foam around the entire mold per Vectorworks request. I then sliced the mold into two inch thick slices, which resulted in 102 slices for the top and bottom molds of the car. You can see slice number seven of our top mold pictured above, along with all the 102 slices of the top mold to the right. Our biggest challenge was to fit all 204 slices of the top and bottom molds onto the 96 pieces of XPS foam we got from Home Depot. Our next step was to print a scale model and create a cut plan for each piece of XPS foam. Once we determined which pieces would fit onto each 4x8 sheet of foam, we used our poster printer to print a full-scale template for each of the slice of our molds. We then cut these out to use as patterns. The patterns were laid down on our assigned 4x8 foot pieces of XPS foam, traced with Sharpie markers, and then cut out with an electric hot knife foam cutter. Each piece was then numbered and holes were drilled in specific spots that were identified on each template so that we could register each slice together with the, uh, the neighboring slices. Back to Maria. Hello again. Here you can see the bottom mold of the car uh, coming together. We used one inch electrical conduit in order to align each slice correctly when assembled. After testing several adhesives, we decided to use 3M Super 77 spray adhesive to bond the two inch foam slices together. We glued three slices together, then laid them flat to cure for one hour while placing weights on the slices to ensure that all three slices were well bonded. Initially, we were then using clamps to glue these groups of slices together, but we quickly ran out of clamping room. So we used gravity to help us assemble the rest of the layers. On the left, you can see a couple of team members spraying Super 77 adhesive to individual foam slices. On the right, we are using scaffolding to help assemble the last few slices of the bottom chassis mold. What you can see is that we also added about six 10 inch screws to help secure each group of slices to the group below it. We were careful to place these away from the two inch of foam that would eventually get milled. By staggering these long screws throughout the foam, we eliminated any gaps between the layers. Once we assembled all of the slices, we put the foam on a plywood base and a two by six frame to secure the foam slices for milling. On the left, you can see our rough cut mold. In the center is a picture of the Vectorworks mill working on our foam. Vectorworks is actually about a three hour drive north of our location and Mr. Phipps has made three trips in the past three weeks to drop off and pick up our molds. So we are very thankful for him. <laughs> On the right is our finished bottom mold, now ready for sanding, sealing, priming and prepping. When constructed this way, we were able to create both the large top and bottom molds for our car for approximately $7,500. If we used high density CNC foam, a foam block this size would have cost around $12,000 and the milling would have been another $12,000. In addition to saving almost $16,500, we also got a lot of new recruits involved in the manufacturing process. And fits. <laughs> Hello again. So, um, we actually have a Haas mill in our, in our school, but um, right now we don't have uh, the ability for our high school students to come into the lab. So currently I'm negotiating with our administration on how to try and get our upperclassmen back into the lab safely and slowly. So over spring break, we did start to, to get uh, permission. We got a couple of team members in and we began milling some of our suspension components. Um, we hope to get our high school students back into the lab as soon as possible. Um, so that we can increase our productivity and in manufacturing the parts uh, for our solar cruiser. Um, I firmly believe that uh, the students need to be making all these parts, so they need to come in and run the mill. And as you know, uh, none of this would be possible without the help of our valued sponsors. Uh, we sincerely thank, we're, we're very, very thankful uh, for everything that they have done and continue to do, um, and for all the support that they've provided us towards our solar cruiser project. So we hope to see you at the Texas Motor Speedway. Uh, we, we have a lot of work to do um, and we're, we're working carefully through our high school and our university's uh, COVID protocols to ensure that we uh, make it to the track in a safe way. 
Um, we can't wait to get to the track. Um, pictured here is actually another, uh, is the team pre-COVID uh, standing uh, next to our all electric GTEV car, uh, which is one of the many other uh, alternative energy projects we've done at FAU High. So that concludes our presentation. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Marks. Um, feel free to reach out to me and uh, the QR code there is of our website uh, that we've got started. Alan, thank you for a great presentation. I want to congratulate your team for being good salesmen for what your project is, and that is students leading a program and excellent planning and engineering. So please give them a pat on the back for me. I think you did a great job and it's always good to see you. You and I have shared many hours hot on the road and at Speedway, so it'll be good yes. to have you back. Yes, looking forward to it very much so. Thank you, okay. Dr. Burke. In order to create a balance here, I've asked one of our longtime staff members, Christian DeGrotti, to talk to us about our electric solar powered vehicle division. Uh, Eric uh, has, um, Christian has been with us for a long time. I've known him, I think, maybe for half his life, starting off with some of our projects at Winston Science, going on to his taking part in the Mansfield team with Ben Barber Career Tech Academy, and now he's staff and has worked almost exclusively. He's our authority in the electric solar powered division. So Christian, who is now an engineer in Houston, let me turn it over to you and give you a chance to talk about your, your electric solar power cars. All right, so as Doc has mentioned, uh, I've actually, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, so we're starting off uh, just talking about the electric solar power division. Um, we're gonna go, oh, there we go. Uh, a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is Christian Negrati. I competed back in 2013 in the race from Fort Worth, Texas to Los Angeles, California. Uh, as Doc said, with the Ben Barber Career Tech Academy Shine, Runner, Shine Runners, uh, based out of Mansfield. It's a little suburb south of uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. And uh, just, I know starting a solar car program can be very daunting. Um, this was our second year, the team's second year competing when I got involved. Um, we were able to build our running car for, I want to say it was twelve or $13,000. It was a very, very inexpensive comparatively for a car. And of that $13,000, about half of it was actually cash and the other half was donations. Um, because you'd be amazed at what you can get teams to donate and what you can, not teams, what you can get companies to donate and what you can truly do on a budget with the right resources. Um, uh, I've been on staff since 2014 with Dr. Marks. Uh, once the electric solar division got added, uh, he asked me to uh, help out and kind of spearhead that division and be the go-to guy. Um, one little thing for those of you who don't know Dr. Marks too well, uh, when he says he asks someone to do it, uh, he is very convincing and he, it is almost impossible to tell him no. Uh, so just be warned. He did used to be a lobbyist, so. Uh, I, I say that jokingly. Now, I, I am doing this completely at my own will. I've actually been bugging him to uh, give me more ways to help out. Uh, but so after high school, I attended Oklahoma State University, where I received my mechanical engineering degree in the fall of 2018. Um, kind of as Rayon was saying earlier, not everyone completes college in four years. Uh, mine was my journey was about five and a half years uh, with a small break in the middle. So I was only in school for four and a half, but yeah, gap years are great things in college. Don't, don't ever let little uh, road bumps in your way stop you from finishing. Um, it opens up so many doors having that one piece of paper that just says you're smart. <laughs> um, I am currently working as an engineer uh, with Waygate Technologies, a Baker Hughes business. Uh, we specialize in industrial inspection equipment, uh, so non-destructive testing. The specific part that I'm in is with uh, X industrial x-ray solutions. I was just telling Dr. Marks before this started, one of our cool products that we have, uh, it's a x-ray box with a arm that reaches out, pulls parts off of assembly lines, 
takes about 20 x-ray images, sets it back on the line about 20 minutes, or not 20 minutes, 20 seconds. Um, I've been doing that for just under a year. And before that, I was working in a different part of the company. Um, but since uh, COVID happened, I ended up relocating to a different portion of the company. I am based in Houston, Texas. Uh, a running joke in Solar Car is this is the only place where when you say the word Houston, you have to specify if you're talking about Texas or Mississippi. Um, because uh, there is a very successful team based out of Houston, Mississippi that's highly involved in solar car. I'm not sure if they're competing this year or not. Um, if not, if you stick around for a year or two, they'll definitely be back. Um, and so, yeah, like Doc said, um, we have known each other for a long, long time. I actually didn't realize how long we had known each other um, because my first experience with engineering was back in middle school. Um, I competed in a just little science fair thing where I built a little Lego car that we programmed to run a track and knock over a water bottle. I didn't think much of it. It was a great, it was my first experience with engineering. And then high school rolls around building a solar car. And then uh, my second, I believe it was my second year on staff when I heard Doc talk about the Winston Science Program. And I was like, oh, I, I competed in that. And he just kind of looked at me, he's like, oh, that was my brainchild. And uh, it's easy for me to say that without uh, the, the influence Dr. Marks has had on me, uh, I would not have pursued engineering at all because my two main introductions and experiences with engineering before I went to college were all because of him. Uh, so, yeah. So we'll move on a little bit. Uh, so the electric solar power division, it, the whole idea behind it, uh, so a lot of people will say, oh, everything's electric solar powered because solar panels create electricity. And yes, you're right. But we call this division electric solar because uh, it's a little different. The whole idea behind it is that it emulates real world applications of automotive technology because the majority of the solar cars you see, they don't have any storage room. They only seat one person and they can't go too far for too long because just solar pa solar panels are heavy, they're not that efficient, and so on. And so the big idea behind this is just that we're removing the charging system from the car. In, in place of having it on the car, we're building a charging station and teams are allowed two battery packs, which I'll get into the more specifications on those later. Um, but a big part of it also is it was our first event that allowed more race day involvement from younger team members. Uh, I know in my first year competing, uh, it was cross country and we had quite a few of the younger team members just kind of drop out over the summer because they started to realize that instead of being able to drive a car across the country, they weren't old enough to drive. And so they just bailed out because they're like, yeah, I get to sit in a car going 20 miles an hour for nine days to drive to, from Texas to California. Um, so a big thing about this is that it gets them involved because they'll get to ride along in the cars and help with some of the daily tasks. Um, so the electric solar division is mostly based on a classic car. It follows a lot of the same specifications and a lot of the same criteria. Uh, but there are some differences. Um, for example, in the classic division, we do have maximum dimensions versus in the electric solar, we have minimum dimensions. And that's just because the reason why we have the minimum dimensions is so teams aren't trying to squish everything together. Uh, we want everything to be spaced out a little bit more so it'll be more comfortable and more real world like because the electric solar division requires two seats side by side. And let's be real, if you're buying a car and the two seats up front have the passenger sitting shoulder to shoulder, borderline on top of each other, no one's going to be comfortable. No one's going to buy the car. It's not realistic. So we add in that minimum width dimension so people are spaced out a little bit more and it's quite a bit more comfortable and you have more cargo area in the vehicle. Um, as I mentioned before, we have the two separate battery packs. They are still limited to being lead acid batteries, which is one of the stipulations that's carried over from the classic division. 
Uh, but instead of one five kilowatt hour battery pack, uh, teams are allowed two battery packs that are rated at two kilowatt hours each. Uh, in the electric solar division, we also have a minimum weight or minimum combined weight for the drivers, for the driver and the uh, passenger versus in the classic division, we don't have a minimum weight. Um, and if in electric solar, you may be thinking, oh no, all my all my drivers and passengers weigh 95 pounds soaking wet. There's no way we're gonna get to the minimum weight. Well, we allow you to add a ballast uh, that has to be secured in a safe fashion to bring that up to the minimum weight. And then another great part about the electric solar division compared to classic is as you've probably seen, if you've even scrolled through any of the pictures on the Solar Car Challenge website or any of our social media pages, a lot of the classic cars will just have the flat panels just on top. And that kind of takes away, one, it takes away aerodynamics, and two, it, it doesn't give you as much freedom to be more expressive with how the car looks. And so with electric solar, with us being able to remove the panels from the vehicle, it allows you to explore more aerodynamic opportunities, be a little bit more creative with how it looks. And you can truly bring the artistic part of engineering into it because yeah, engineering is all math and science and it's usually run by the numbers. But the thing is, usually you can make the numbers work and be a little creative and have some, and make something that looks pretty awesome too. Uh, some of the strategy differences are optimizing the charge and discharge rates to maximize your time on track uh, because there's many different graphs and charts you can look at that show how batteries will charge from zero to 80 percent in about half the time it takes for the battery to charge from that 80 to 100 uh, percent. So um, in the past, we've had teams that would only charge their battery packs up to the 80 percent and then discharge them down to 20, 25% before they come in and swap them. Um, but that's just, it varies by team to team strategy, but it's just an extra variable to bring in along with uh, efficiently developing a battery change process. A uh, big thing we've seen over the years is the more successful teams in this division are the ones who spend less time off the track changing their battery and have a more, um, a more streamlined process for it. Uh, some common issues, uh, not having a defined battery change procedure. If you haven't seen a trend yet, um, there is definitely a trend here where uh, every, every year we seem to have one or two teams that show up that hadn't even thought about their battery change procedure other than, oh yeah, it just, it comes out and goes back in and we, we, we just keep racing. But, they always end up running into issues because there'll either be a safety issue of uh, when it comes to lifting the heavy batteries versus a safety issue with the electricity. And um, a big thing that I tell all the teams, write it out, assign roles to people and practice it. Practice, practice, practice. Um, next bulletin I've got on here is a safe battery change procedure. Like I said, this is a very big part of the contest. Um, in the past, we've had teams that were doing some, that wanted to do what we considered unsafe practices to change their batteries. Um, the example I'll use is we had one team that had their battery pack in the vehicle. They had the emergency disconnect on one side. And then on the other side of the vehicle, they had someone disconnect manually disconnecting a lead, like a battery terminal lead that was just kind of, that was just screwed onto like, I want to say it was onto the fuse block. And that created a hazard because if the person who is unscrewing the lead touches, you know, works with it before the battery disconnect is hit, you're dealing with the potential for electric shock. And it, it was one of those things that turned out because on the other side, they had a plug with a, a two prong plug that only, they were only using one of the prongs for. And all they had to do was basically run the wire to that prong instead to that plug. And they were able to correct the issue in a matter of minutes. But it, I later found out from a team member, it was just them trying to cut corners, and not properly run the wires. Uh, 
Um, and it's one of those things, sometimes it's just something small and easy, like rerunning a wire that can dramatically change the safety aspect of it. Um, another issue we've seen in the past was meeting the minimum dimensions in a safe manner. Uh, two or three years ago, wow, I've been doing this long enough, I can't keep the years straight. Um, <laughs> I want to say it was probably about three years ago, we had a team that in order to meet their minimum dimensions, they had built basically like a like kind of like a bubble car type thing, but then for their cage and then just coming off the back end, they had a single piece of round, like, like half inch solid metal just coming off the back. And that ended up posing a safety hazard to other vehicles because if there was ever an issue that someone would be coming up behind them and stopping distances, brakes failing, et cetera, um, the stinger was right at the perfect height where it would have impaled the driver of the following vehicle. Um, so we ended up having to have them creatively find a way to eliminate the safety hazard while still meeting the minimum dimensions for the rules. Uh, da -da -da -da. So for the scrutineering station, I believe it's station eight. It's been eight the last couple of years. Uh, that number may change eventually, but the big thing with that station is we inspect the uh, electric solar powered units for the specific rules and regulations. So we'll inspect things like the meeting the vehicle's minimum dimensions, the minimum weights, we'll weigh every driver and passenger. Uh, we'll inspect and verify that your charging station meets all of our rules and regulations. Uh, we'll ensure the stability and safety of the station movement. If you're planning on rotating the panels to track the sun. Uh, one year we had a team that had a system in place where they were putting, where trying to think how to describe this without describing it too well. Uh, basically they had a triangle base and then the panels were just on top and there was a single pipe running through for the panels and that they would use to rotate it. And they had pins that they were locking into the to use it to lock in a place. But over time, the panels were bending in a way or were rotating in a way and resting on the pins that were actually bending them and warping them and uh, hurting their structural integrity. So we ended up having to work with that team so that they could get something in place that would be able to hold it and maintain the structural integrity of it. Uh, another big event, part of uh, the electric solar power uh, for the close track events is gonna be how we place the charging stations for the length of the event. Generally in the past, we have always used the secondary garage for this, or we've done them around the media center. Um, and in the past, we've either assigned spots at check-in. And then I know one year we ended up uh, meeting with, I had all the team captains basically get together, draw numbers and pick spots. Uh, so I'm not sure which method we're going to use this coming year. Um, but we always, we never make any decisions unless it's all the team captains are involved with assigning the spots to make sure everyone understands their boundaries and the rules and regulations with it. Um, another big thing that we're going to be checking this coming year is that is ensuring that all battery terminals are secured properly using lock washers uh, specifically to prevent fires and sparkings and potential arcing. Uh, this was an issue uh, a couple of years ago, one year or two years ago, I don't remember how long ago it was. Uh, it was uh, when we went to California, this most recent time, there was a team that uh, they had an issue in their battery box and we're um, fairly confident it came from a loose battery terminal that sparked and ended up catching on fire. And so that's just a big issue that we're gonna be looking at moving forward. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just open it up if anyone has any questions regarding the electric solar power division. Christian, I want to thank you for participating in this and giving us a perspective about uh, one of our exciting new divisions in the solar car challenge. When we started this thing off 25 years ago, it was just sort of a plain Jane concept solar array with low efficiency, uh, your lead acid batteries, wheels, uh, steering wheel, and that was about it. But now 
offering these other two divisions, our electric solar power division and our new cruiser division, then we give, give teams that have been part of the Solar Guard Challenge for a while a chance to move on and do new things. And that's what our goal is. I'm excited to thank y'all for everything that y'all have done today. Eric, thank you for being here. Alan, thank you for participating. Uh, Ray, I appreciate your sharing your enthusiasm. And Christian, thank you for sharing your enthusiasm and our long history. I am looking forward to our next presentation. Where we're going to be hearing from uh, an electrical engineer from Texas Instruments, looking at some of the things that are really important in building a solar car that I think you should be willing to tune in for. I'll give you more uh, event specifications as we get closer. Thank you all for being with us today. This ends the first in our late spring series, Solar Car Challenge webinar. Thanks, Chris, for being our host today.